Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. The last piece that we ended up mentioning right at the end was force centripetal, right here. So we're going to take a look here. And again, remember, you guys have notes on all of this stuff that I have already outlined and given to you guys. So force centripetal, as we already discussed, is the force that is causing the object to move in a circle. But, this is a big thing here, that force is not is not anything new. What do I mean by that? Well, previously when we did dynamics and we learned about forces, we learned about forces such as force applied, force of friction, force normal, and force of gravity. And those were different forces. And if you remember in the case of force applied, we spent some time talking about the fact that force applied could be many different things, right? It could be force of thrust for something being pushed up into the air, for example, or force of tension where I'm pulling on something. And that kind of all of these were just really for supply, just with a special extra name. Force centripetal is the same. Force centripetal is just talking about the force that is causing the circular motion, but the force centripetal is created by one of the other four forces, usually force applied, for example. Okay, so what are we seeing here? Okay, um, if we take a look at the notes, it mentions here that. Newton's law says that any mass that experiences acceleration must be affected by a force. That is what's happening, right? Newton's second law states that F equals ma. And, of course, as we know, F equals ma, and in circular motion, a equals v squared over r. So, F equals mv squared over r. Done. And we call that force C. But when we're talking about it, the way that we might want to consider it is sigma fc. What does sigma mean again? It means sum, it means add. Add everything in that particular dimension. So think about that. What is that telling us? Hmm. Hmm, I say. Fc is adding all the forces that are involved in the circle. The notes further say, let's like let's expand on this. This force is not new, it's just a special name we give to the sum of forces that cause the circle. Like how tension and thrust are basically force applied, right? As I just said. So let's do some examples here, okay? So we're gonna have um, here we go, top down view. Here we go, we got our circle. And in our top down view, we're gonna talk about, let's say, uh, a model airplane. Okay, so a model airplane. On a string and it's going in a circle just like this okay so of course the velocity is tangent to the circle as we've discussed before and the acceleration points to the center the force centripetal of course follows the acceleration because it's the only vector component of the whole thing so it goes to the center boom so if this is the direction and this is the force and it's going like this well, what is causing this force well it's on a string so the string connected up to that airplane is what's causing it to continue moving in a circle. If I remove the string, instead of it continuing to go around, it will just go off in a tangent, straight line. So we need that string in order for this to work. Hmm. So what is causing the thing to move in a circle, why it's the force of tension, or FA. If we have a yo-yo, right? We have a yo-yo and we spin the yo-yo over our head. Well, it's the same thing. The yo-yo is an object on a string. So a yo-yo on a string would also be FA. What about, this is always a strange one, what about a car going around a curve, right? a curve in the road? So we're going to do a car from the back here. Here's the road, and then here's the back of the car, and I'm going to give it two wheels like so. So the road, of course, is curving kind of like this, right? We're, just, we're looking at it from behind, but the road is sort of curving like this, 
And even though the curve of the road is not a full circle, it's part of a circle. And so let's think it through, right? We've got four forces. F-A, where's F-A? Okay, well, hopefully you know that in the case of a car, the car engine makes the car go forward. That's its whole pop purpose. So the car is going to continue to go sort of around the curve here. Now, in order to draw an arrow going into the board like that, the way physicists do it is they put an X. That's supposed to represent the arrow moving uh, away from you, like the arrow from a bow and arrow kind of thing. So we could say that the force applied is making the car go around the curve. It's going that way around the road. So F-A is not what's causing us to go in a circle, because where is the center of the circle in this context, right? The center of the circle is where the force the centripetal has to point. Well, the center of the circle is going to be over here somewhere. Okay, so we've got that one. Um, force of gravity, this one's easy. Which way does gravity point? Points down, always points down. So there we go, F-G. What about F-N? What's F-N going to do? Well, Fn is force perpendicular to the surface. The surface is flat ground, so the force perpendicular will be pointing up. So there we go. And we'll put our Fn up through the words of that entire question. Well, look at this. We've run out of forces. There's literally only one force left. So guess which force is causing this object to go in a circle? Yeah, it's going to be the force of friction. Now, to be fair, force of friction is going to be behaving in two different ways here, right? One, it's going to be effect opposing the force applied, right? Because the, the car is trying to go forward and friction is going to try to stop it. But there's also the fact that the car is like trying to go at an angle like this, right? It's trying to turn. It's trying to go around, right? It's trying to go like this, around. Well, if the car tires don't have enough friction with the road, then when they try to go sideways like this, they'll instead just be pushed up like that. That's when you slip and slide on, say, ice, for example. So a car going around a curve, the force of friction is the source of force of centripetal. If there's no friction, I can't go around the curve. Let's do some other weird ones. What about... Uh, Let's see, uh, the International Space Station. Huh? Right, the International Space Station. We're going to have that go around the Earth here. Okay, let's see if I can draw ourselves an Earth here. Maritime, space, uh, James Bay, Hudson Bay. So we'll go up and back. Okay, well, apparently going off into the thing. So there we go. Earth, and then we're going to have a satellite, International Space Station, so we'll put it right here, give it some wings for solar panels, okay? Now, the International Space Station doesn't just sit there, right? It orbits the Earth. It has to, because that's how orbital mechanics work. Now, don't worry, we're not going to deal with those. Those are grade 12. But if it's going around the Earth, what's keeping it in that orbit. Something has to be pulling it. Well, it's not force normal. There's no surface. There's no friction because there's nothing in space. Uh, force applied, I guess, but if that was the case, then that means that the International Space Station would constantly have to have a rocket booster pushing it all the time. And that's not going to work, so we're down to one option. Force of gravity. The force of gravity pulls things to the center of the Earth so the International Space Station, you'll notice that point in the center of the Earth, well, that's the center of the circle. So the International Space Station gets its force from the force of gravity. So what we're seeing here is that in different times and in different ways and in different places, different forces will cause this thing to move in a circle. And the reason why we can sort of consider force centripetal to be kind of like um, sigma Right, like sigma fc, is for the same reason that we've used sigma in the past, right? Sigma fx, sigma fy were sums of forces. They were us taking all the forces and adding them together. Sigma fc is just us saying we're going to add together all the forces that are involved in the circle direction. 
So, okay. Hopefully this is making some sense. Uh, let's do some examples, okay? I've got a couple examples in the notes here. We're going to do both of them right away. Usually in class I would do one and the other, but we're going to throw them both together here just because. All right. So it says here, what is the speed that a car can safely navigate a 50-meter curve in icy winter if the coefficient of friction is 0.1? Hmm. Point 0.1 for the coefficient of friction is not very high, but that makes sense because, you know, again, winter. So we're going to have a situation where we have a car, and the car is sitting on the road, just like we did here. And we've said that the coefficient of friction is 0 0.1, okay? What else did it say? A uh, 50-meter curve, okay, so the radius is 50. And that's it. It doesn't tell us anything else. Hmm. Interesting, right? Well, we already said the force centripetal is going to be equal to the force of friction because that's what keeps a car on the road. Force of friction between the tires and the, wheel, and the uh, road to make sure that the tires don't slide and just go straight. So at this point we start to fill in some numbers because we know that the force centripetal is going to be mv squared over r and we know that the force of friction is going to be mu fn. Okay, not so bad so far. Um, we don't have v, we're looking for v. Uh, we do have R, so we could fill that in. Okay, so I can go m v squared over 50 equals, okay, we, we have the coefficient of friction, so I can put that in, 0 0.1 fn. Well, what's fn in this situation, right? Again, reminder, every situation is going to be a little different, so you've got to be able to figure out what works for this particular situation. And what we see here is that Fn is going to equal Fg because this is just a flat object sitting on a totally normal surface and there's no forces working on angles. So Fn is going to equal good old Fg. So if I put Fg here, I could put Fg by itself, but I can also just put it as m times g. We know what G is. G is easy. That's 9.8. It's always 9.8 on Earth. I'm assuming this car is on Mars. We don't have M. Yeah, we've seen this problem before. You don't have M? What's the big deal? You don't need M. What do you do? You just cancel M because it's on both sides in a multiplication kind of question. Right? It doesn't matter what this number is. It's 10. Well, I'm, I'm multiplying both sides by 10, so it doesn't matter. So these, boom. Go away. So what that actually kind of means is really weird. It means it doesn't actually matter how heavy the car is. Super light car, super heavy car, same effect. Now, of course, the reason for that is because it's assuming that a light and heavy car have the same coefficient of friction. Generally, what happens is that a lighter car will have a slightly lower coefficient of friction because it'll have less contact between the two surfaces. But, you know, we're keeping it simple here. Well, as simple as we can get it. So here we go. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of algebra. We're going to get v is equal to the square root of 0 0.1, 9.8, and 50. So v is equal to, get out our trusty calculator, 9.8 times 50 times 0.1 equals square root. We get 7 meters per second. OK, uh, 7 meters per second. We're talking about cars. We don't talk about meters per second for car. So what is that in kilometers per hour? You remember how to do that, right? There's a certain number, 3.6. So we take 7 and we multiply it by 3.6 to get kilometers per hour, and what we get is that this is going to be 25 kilometers per hour. Now, for all of you who are driving, think about it. How many of those... Uh, the on-ramps and the clover leaves along the perimeter highway and such. How many of those have a speed grading that is lower than the rest of the highway? Usually they say about 40. 
Well, that's of course assuming that the weather is good, right? It's warm, it's not slippery. This is an icy road. On an icy road, you'd have to slow down even further. But you can see, if you did anything more than that, then what'll happen is, is that the force of friction isn't strong enough to keep you on the road. So instead, you'll start to slide off the road into the ditch. So yeah, there you go. That is how to solve one of these questions. And it's pretty straightforward compared to all the things we've done before. Now, it does get a little harder. Right? We're going to do a little bit of a harder question right now. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. We're going to have to get some board space. This one is for an amusement ride called the Gravitron. Now, in the uh, plan, the physics plan, I have a series of videos showing a Gravitron and some other things like it and how circular motion can do some pretty fun things. But uh, right now, we're going to talk about some of the math behind the Gravitron. So the basic premise of the Gravitron is that you've got a giant circle, a cylinder, usually, something like this. And what happens is, is that you sort of come in, and you go, and you stand next to the wall. Then they take the Gravitron, and they start to spin it. And they spin it really, really fast. And as they spin it, right, you're sitting here, and as they're spinning it, boo, 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 you get stuck to the wall, and then the floor drops away. And you just sit there. You sit on the wall, even though there's nothing supporting you, and you stay there. And it's always like, how does that happen? What's going on? So if you've never been to a Gravitron, um, I recommend it. They're pretty fun. But now you can also do math while you're in one. Yay. So for this particular ride here, we're going to say that it's going to spin at 30 RPMs. And in the notes it says that it's got a radius of 1.9. And we've got to understand what's going on in this situation. Once again, let's get out our trusty colors and see if we can map out everything. Green. Gravity. Which way is gravity? Gravity is easy. Gravity points down because we're on Earth. Boom. Normally, to oppose gravity, we would say force normal. But force normal is force perpendicular to a surface. Well, I can't put that up because there's no surface under my feet. The floor isn't pushing up on me. Where is a surface? It's here. And then the force normal, force perpendicular to the surface, is going to be this way? Well, that's weird. Why is the force normal pushing to the center of the circle? Oh, wait, there's our force centripetal, but why? Well, because it's perpendicular to the surface. Okay, sure, whatever, that's the definition of force normal, but why is there a force normal at all? What is creating that force normal, right? Normally, force normal is created by an object resting on the surface. Gravity's pulling it down, and the, and, the, and the surface is pushing up to stop it from going down. So what is opposing gravity here? Is it F.A.? Is the person sitting in the ride having to lift themselves up, doing like the most badass chin-ups the whole time? No. It's also not force normal, and it's not force gravity, so we're actually running out of options. It's got to be friction. Why is it friction? Well, think about it. Floor drops out. You immediately start to slide down. What's, what's friction going to do? Friction's going to do what friction does. Whoa, 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 stop moving. I don't want you to move. And there you go. And of course, friction trying to stop something moving. What's the friction formula? Ah, there's force normal coming out of it. So because there's friction, it causes a force normal between the various surfaces. Ta-da! Realistically, solving this question isn't actually very difficult. The hard part is being able to put the whole problem together properly because it changes everything on its head. Instead of being force normal up, it's force normal, well, in this case, left. That's the only problem requires us to be able to look at the situation and assign the forces as they fit rather than as we've done it every other time. And that's always tricky. So now if we try to solve for a particular problem here, what we can do is we can say, okay, 
In order for this to work, what is the coefficient of friction? Well, we set it up. The sum of forces that are causing this thing to move in a circle is going to be equal to, in this case, Fn. Well, we're looking for the force of friction. So we also know this. And here's Fn. Well, Fn is equal to Fc. So I can just put Fc right there. And that'll be equal to mu F mu. OK, well, I don't have this. And I don't have this yet, and I don't have that. So let's start expanding some things, OK? Fc, well, we know what that is. That's going to be mv squared over r. OK, and this is still mu. And then what about the force of friction? Well. Am I going down? No. Am I going up? No. So that means that this and this have to be the same. It's the only way this will work. If they're not the same, I will go up or down in some direction. So that means F mu can be replaced with good old mg. Hopefully a pattern is starting to emerge. Do we need the mass of the occupant inside of the gravitron? No. The masses cancel. We just need the g. We're looking for mu, so we just need to get, oh, we have r, so we just need v. Well, we don't have v, but we've got 30 revolutions per minute. So 30 revolutions per minute cycle over 60 seconds. Oh, well, is that all? So. I just simply take out my trusty calculator in case someone has forgotten how to do math. I know it's been a while. 30 divided by 60, well, that's just a 0 0.5 hertz. That's frequency. Now we know how to solve for velocity, I hope. The velocity of a circle is 2 pi r nu, frequency. So I go 2 pi times 1.9 times 0 0.5, okay? 9 times 0.5 times pi times 2 equals, we're going to get just shy of 6. Then we're going to plug all of that in over here, and that should do it. So we're going to get, m's cancel, we're going to have 9.8. I'm going to move the r over 1.9. Divide all of that by 6 squared, and we're going to get 0.8 times 1.9 divided by 1.8, and we're going to get a coefficient of friction of 0 0.5. So provided you've got at least a 0 0.5, you will stick to the walls of the gravitron. If you have the, I don't know, um, particularly sweaty, maybe you'd slide too much. I don't know. That's not actually true. Sweat tends to be a little bit more of a sticking result. But there you go. So that is a gravitron kind of situation. That is how those sort of questions work. And now you guys see how to solve them. At this point, we're done with horizontal circles. The only thing left in this unit is vertical circles. So you guys should have your test by the end of the week. I will be leaving uh, that up soon enough. And uh, actually, I'm just going to make the vertical circle video right away. So I will see you guys next time.